When you hear discussions about the conflict between Russia and the West, with Ukraine as its proxy, what comes to your mind? If you are from the US or Western Europe and usually watch mainstream media, you likely imagine something like this. An evil Russia, led by a Hitler-like president, an innocent Ukraine, and a noble, brave superhero America. But does this imagery truly reflect the current situation and accurately represent the real, actual geopolitical reality? If you think so, let me offer a perspective that might add more complexity to your worldview. There is no doubt that black and white worldview is very comfortable. It's simple, easy to understand, and also makes it simple to pick a side. After all, everyone wants to be with the good guys, and no one wants to align with Hitler. It's simple. But the problem is, this perspective is far too primitive to even roughly represent reality. So let's briefly discuss the main narratives on the Russia-Ukraine conflict that are promoted by the Western media. The main narrative suggests that we are witnessing an unprovoked Russian aggression or unprovoked Russian invasion in Ukraine. While it is undoubtedly aggression and invasion, the term unprovoked requires more context to avoid any misperception of reality. When you hear the term unprovoked aggression, you probably imagine something like this. However, that particular image doesn't take into account some of the nuances that preceded this war, such as NATO's proclaimed intent to accept Ukraine, Russia's multiple warnings against this, and Ukraine's aggression against its own population in the East, with thousands of civilian casualties. Честно говоря, я не расцениваю их как своих братьев. Не мы начали войну. Война пришла к нам. Понимаете? Видео вот этой фашистской хунты в Киеве. Любишь Украину? You can't say that you had nothing to do with it. And of course, that, that's also during the eight years of the basically civil war that was fought before that, where there were uh, thousands upon thousands of uh, Ukrainians on the eastern side, on the Donbass side, that were killed by Ukrainians on the western side uh, because they didn't like what they were doing. So this had been going on for a long time. So to say that Ukraine did nothing and they're just sitting there and just bam, one day, wow, here comes a, a Russian invasion, is just belies the facts. Let's check out what a well-known American economist and academic Jeffrey Sachs has to say about it. This conflict goes back actually more than 30 years to 1990 when President Gorbachev who I had the honor to help support as an economic advisor to his economic team, unilaterally disbanded the Warsaw Pact military alliance of the Soviet Union. Unilaterally. And when he did it, he received solemn assurances by Germany and the United States that NATO would not fill the vacuum with US-led military bases and alliances. And the United States lied. Not for the first time, by the way. Because as soon as the military alliance of the Soviet Union was disbanded, the neoconservatives in the United States, that is the military industrial complex and its supporters, began to plot the eastward movement of NATO. And this started already in 1992. And then in the mid-1990s, after President Clinton had told further lies to President Yeltsin, who I also had the honor to help advise, NATO began its enlargement. First to three Central European countries, Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia, which became Czech Republic. In 2004, NATO expanded to seven more countries, including the Baltic States, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, and Slovakia. And then in 2008, George Bush Jr. proposed, insisted that NATO would move to Ukraine and to Georgia. And President Putin at the time and in the year before had made absolutely clear that is the ultimate red line for us. And it was in this context also we should recall that the United States had unilaterally abandoned the ABM treaty and started placing missiles in Eastern Europe. And so in 2008, President Putin already told Bush that this was leading to conflict and that Russia would take Crimea if the US persisted in its move. Then please understand that in 2010, 11, 12, 13, Ukraine tried to walk a delicate balancing act <coughs> between the United States pressures and Russia. President Yanukovych called for neutrality, which is what he understood rightly to be necessary to save Ukraine from the disaster that it's in right now. The United States could not abide by neutrality. And so the United States contributed to the violent overthrow of Yanukovych in February 2014. We say it's the Maidan revolution, the spontaneous uprising. But the United States at the most senior levels was involved in that, quote, spontaneous uprising, including the then Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, 
So this war started, by the way, February 2014, not February 2022. It's a lie that it started February 2022. It started with the overthrow of a government trying to maintain neutrality. And the United States helped put in power extreme nationalists in Ukraine who broke the neutrality policy, demanded NATO membership as soon as possible, and welcomed billions of dollars of arms shipments from the United States starting in 2014. So this war going into its ninth year came from a direct collision between two nuclear superpowers. How stupid is this? I can't even use polite language because the people in the United States government that have provoked this, these neoconservatives who have been in power for more than 30 years are putting the entire world in danger. I understand some might argue, but Ukraine is an independent sovereign country and can join whatever military alliance it wants. That doesn't give anyone the rights to invade it. While this statement makes sense in an ideal, just world with equal opportunities for each country, we don't live in a perfect world of pink ponies. Sure. No, are you kidding me? <laughs> We live in a brutal reality where great military and economic powers dictate their terms to weaker countries and defend their interests as they see fit. Of course, you can ignore this fact and end up like Ukraine. Or you can consider the risks of opposing one of the greatest military and nuclear powers in the world and maybe, just maybe, adjust your policy accordingly. To better understand my point, let's imagine a hypothetical situation. One beautiful morning, Mexico decides that they love Russia so much that they want to join its military alliance, create joint military bases close to the US border, and maybe even place nuclear weapons there in the future. Just in case. What do you think the US reaction would be? Ah, it's alright. We respect your independence to choose your way. We're cool, man. Or would they react as they always do when other countries step on their interests? question. Of course, Mexico is free to choose joining military alliance with Russia, but would that be a smart choice? Probably not, if by smart you mean preserving your country's safety and the lives of your people. And what about the innocent West? Is it really the superhero who exclusively acts out of a sense of justice and to make the world a better place? Well, not exactly. In this regard, I really appreciate this meme. If you haven't seen this series The Boys, I highly recommend it, by the way. You should understand that the West's action in Ukraine are largely influenced by the interests of beneficiaries within the capitalist system. I'm referring to corporations like BlackRock and, of course, private military industry. Check out what Mike Benz has to say about it. If you know that the military or the State Department or the CIA is going to overthrow a government or privatize an industry, you know, a trillion dollar industry in Venezuela or Ukraine that's owned by the state government, but now it's going to be privatized. So if you're an early investor in that, your investment is going to go to the moon. So for example, when the military moves into Ukraine, they draft behind that. A great example of this actually is in the run-up to the 2014 Maidan coup, the CIA State Department sponsored overthrow of the democratically elected government of Ukraine. Whether you agree with that or not, then's just the facts. <laughs> Victoria Newland actually gave that speech about how they successfully orchestrated this using five billion dollars, five billion with a B, in State Department and U.S. aid subsidies to the right wing, right sector groups in Ukraine who did this. She gave that speech bragging about that that five million dollars in U.S. financial sponsorship of the coup, right at a conference that was right in front of, sponsored by Chevron, Exxon Mobil, and Shell. And by the way. Those are the exact companies who had invested in the oil and gas space in Ukraine. Chevron had signed in 2013 a $10 billion, again with a B, $10 billion partnership with Naftogas, the Ukrainian state gas giant, which accounts for an overwhelming majority of Ukraine's national economic sector. Shell had signed a $10 billion, again, imagine $10 billion partnership with Naftogas in Ukraine, again, with a B. So Halliburton uh, had signed a deal with the Ukrainian government's Naftogas in order to do all the oil and gas refining of the oil and gas space there. You know who held the rights to the Black Sea shale resources? that were destroyed when Russia annexed Crimea, all the shale rights in the Black Sea Basin there, it was Burisma. You know, not only was Hunter Biden on the board of Burisma, but Hunter Biden himself was on the chairman's advisory board of the NDI, the National Democratic Institute. You know what the NDI is? That's the DNC branch of the NED, 
which is the CIA cutout created so that the CIA could run money without it having the formal fingerprints of the CIA during the CIA 2.0 restructuring. So what conclusions can we draw from all said above? Who are the bad guys and who are the good guys? Is Russia a good guy? Well, the truth is the real world does not operate in terms of superheroes and supervillains or the pure good and pure evil. It operates based on the dynamics between countries' interests and the means they have to pursue these interests. So no one is really a good guy in this ugly war situation. It's mostly a result of clashing interests between politicians and greedy corporations, with normal people from both sides paying the highest price.